Uh, he is somewhat under the weather, and uh, so he asked if I might fill in. Glad to do that. Um, so as we prepare ourselves for the study of the Word of God, let's uh, remember Robbie in prayer, and uh, uh, let's pray for this class. Okay, let's pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that we have the freedom in this nation to assemble, to study your word, to boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, the only solution to man's problems, and to declare that your word is absolute truth. Father, we pray that you will continue to keep us free so that we can continue to take your word. In chapter 42, we have four poems, beautiful, beautiful poems about the servant of Yahweh, the one that God would send into the world to redeem Israel. But we see in this fourth song that he is also uh, to redeem the Gentiles. So this is a poem. It starts in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, and it goes through Isaiah 53, verse 12. Now in this song, we have five stanzas, sometimes called strophes. The first strophe is found in Isaiah 52, 13, 14, 15, and we begin in that passage, and it uh, declares that the Lord is going to exalt his servant. And when he calls Jesus servant here, we need to understand the word servant uh, is not a lowly term, but it's used for a trusted envoy somebody who has been given specific responsibilities. And Jesus Christ is the servant of Yahweh. He is declared to be so in numerous passages in the Old Testament, but also when we come to the book of Acts, Peter's first sermon at Pentecost, he refers to Jesus as the servant of the Lord. And so we are not told in this song that this is specifically Messiah, and yet this song is quoted over and over again in the New Testament, and it is definitely referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. <clears throat> so we open with the fact that the servant is going to be exalted. He's going to be extolled, and then Right after that, we find out that he suffers. But God made the point of telling us right at the very beginning he's going to be exalted. And then we see suffering on, uh, that the servant will endure. He does this on behalf of his people. He does it also on behalf of Gentiles. And then we go through much of the suffering of Messiah, and then the song is going to close also with this great hymn of exaltation. So he is exalted at the beginning. He is exalted at the end. In the middle, we see the great suffering of this servant in order to bring about redemption for the entire human race. So we have spent some time in the first three of these strophes, and the last time I spoke on this passage, we were in the fourth, and we're going to begin with the fourth strophe, which is Isaiah 53, verses 7 through 9. So verse 7, he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is dumb or silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now viewed from the standpoint of mankind, 
the suffering of Messiah is just a, a tragic misfortune of the innocent, a miscarriage of justice. And we'd say, oh, that's too bad. And that is the way so many people view the death of Jesus. I think almost everybody in, in this country has heard about Jesus and has seen pictures of him uh, in his crucifixion. But many people have no idea whatever of the significance of this. They just know here was this man, he was crucified, but they don't understand what that was all about. But uh, we're going to see precisely what it's about as we uh, come to this particular refrain in the song. So verse 7 speaks of the silence of the servant. As he suffered, he did it in silence. That is, he didn't complain in any way about the great mistreatment that he was enduring. And it starts out by saying he was oppressed. Now, the word oppressed means to exact something, to exert a very demanding pressure. The essential meaning of this word can be seen back in the book of Exodus, uh, where the people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt, and this word is used for the Egyptian overseers, the taskmasters. Uh, and uh, the Pharaoh had said to the taskmasters, you tell these uh, Israelites that they are to make the bricks, but they can't have straw, and uh, yet they have to maintain their output of bricks. And uh, when the Israelites were not able to do this, then they were beaten by the uh, overseers of Pharaoh. And so that's this word that was used, oppression, in this sense. So he uh, was under great pressure, and he was afflicted. The word afflicted means to force, to try to force someone into submission. It means to punish, to inflict pain upon. And the, the word is used in several different ways in the Old Testament. It's used of what one does to his enemy. It speaks of the pain that is inflicted upon enemies. It was used for Joseph when he was in prison, when he was in, uh, first sold into slavery into Egypt, and then you recall he was uh, sold to Potiphar, and then Potiphar's wife accused him, and he was thrown into prison, and he was put into stocks, and, and there he uh, endured a lot of pain, and this word afflicted was used for uh, Joseph in uh, prison in Psalm 105, verse 18. Uh, it also is the word that's used for what the Egyptians did to Israel in Egypt in Exodus 1, verses 11 and 12, and it goes beyond merely being slaves, but it's talking about the fact that they were abused in that slavery. Uh, in Numbers 24, 24, this word is used for the physical pain that's brought on by warfare. It's used for what God does to his enemies. God says, I will afflict my enemies in Deuteronomy 26, 6. Uh, also, it's interesting that the form of this word afflicted is reflexive. A reflexive means that the subject acts upon itself. Um, and so we have here, he was oppressed, but he was afflicted. And so the idea is that he is going to afflict himself for the sins of his people. And actually what this does is to denote Messiah humbling himself by submitting himself to the oppression of the ungodly, and it indicates a willingness to endure suffering. So he was oppressed, he was afflicted, but when he endured this, it's not something that was forced upon him. It's something that he was willing to take upon himself. And so he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
Now, this means he did not open his mouth in his own defense, and he did not do this before Caiaphas or Herod or Pilate, but rather he is going to submit to all of the indignities that they are going to put upon him, and his voluntary submission is further stressed in the fact that in spite of all of the horrible maltreatment, he did not open his mouth. And this is something that was so significant that it's recorded in all four of the Gospels. They make a point of telling us Jesus didn't complain about all that he was suffering. So he didn't open his mouth, and it means uh, to justify himself or to complain about the fact that he was being mistreated. And so Jesus did open his mouth. I mean, he spoke. We read uh, of several conversations that he did have. Um, so he talked with the high priest. He talked with Pilate. Um, he talked to Judas and the soldiers in the garden. But he's not complaining. That's the point here. He's not trying to justify himself. So there's no contradiction in saying he didn't open his mouth, and yet he did speak uh, at various times uh, from the time of his arrest uh, and on through his crucifixion. Then it says, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. So in contrast to the wandering sheep that we saw in Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Now we have a lamb, and Jesus now is led like a lamb to the slaughter, but he is not going to uh, fight against this. Now the context suggests that the slaughter uh, indicates that this is sacrificial in nature. So the lamb is being led to a slaughter, and it's going to be a sacrificial death. And so the servant voluntarily submits himself to sacrificial death, and this is uh, certainly a meaning supported in this context. We find it also, uh, for example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, where he is the lamb without blemish and without spot. All right, in verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Now, there are a number of translation problems in this particular verse, and I really think that the way we have it in our English translations is far too mild. So this verse speaks of the trial and the death of the servant, and it again emphasizes the substitu substitutionary nature of his death. So he was taken. Now, the word taken means to lay hold of, to seize, to snatch, or to take away. And it indicates, not well, he was just taken, but it indicates that it was a violent seizing of Jesus. Now, it says he was taken from prison. The word prison means a place that's closed up. It means confinement, or it means oppression. So he was taken from prison and from judgment. Now this word judgment, it's the Hebrew word mishpat, and it means justice. Sometimes it means an ordinance. It's the most common word used to designate the function of government in any realm and in any form. This is the function of government. Now in the ancient Near East, this function of government was often not based on any law, but it was based upon the one who was in authority. So he might be a king, some kind of a ruler. And what he said was law, so it wasn't that they had a code, but it's whatever he said. And that was also 
um, how they dispense their justice. So the judgment in view here is a result of coercion and judicial action. Violent action was taken against the servant within a legal context. And as a result of six illegal trials, a judicial murder was perpetrated. So we have here a legal process. He endured six trials before the cross, all of them illegal in one way or another. Justice was perverted, first of all, by uh, the, the Jews who judged him, and then by the Romans who judged him, and justice broke down on that night, and violent action was taken, and there was a judicial murder of Jesus Christ. So he was taken from prison and from justice. And who will declare his generation? Uh, the word declare, uh, interesting word, it doesn't especially mean to declare. It's a word that means to go over something in your mind. It means to contemplate. It means to meditate. Now this contemplation could be mental or it could be verbal. Oftentimes we find the word for meditate and it indicates something that's verbal. And that's what we have in this word. So that somebody is thinking about something. Do you ever talk to yourself? out loud. Now, what did you do that for, you idiot? See, I, I do that frequently. <laughs> well, that's what this means. It means you're, you're going over something, and it may just be silent, or you may actually voice this, and that's uh, the, the word sometimes means to voice a thought, and that's why it was translated declare in some of our English translations but it means to consider something. And so it says, and who among his generation has considered something? The word generation, some debate about the meaning of this word, but essentially it means a group that's related to another by natural descent. So generation from one generation to another, the descendants. Or it can uh, simply mean contemporaries, those of your generation, your contemporaries. And that's what we have here. The, the generation here is talking about the Jews of Jesus' day. They knew about his crucifixion. Many of them witnessed that crucifixion. But who among them considered the significance of it? And the answer is not many. Most of them, as we already saw earlier in this song, we did esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Their attitude was he had it coming. The only reason that he is being crucified is because he deserved it. And obviously God is the one who was behind all of this because if he were the sinless son of God as he claimed, then God would not have allowed that. But what these people did not consider of his day, that what he was doing was substitutionary in, uh, in its effect. And so, and as for his generation, who, that is who among them, considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. The word cut off, indicates a violent, premature, unnatural death, although the term does not indicate the exact cause of death. When it says cut off, it doesn't mean he was somehow cut, but it means that he was separated. The verb describes the division of an object, um, and when it's followed by a preposition, he was cut off from, uh, it indicates a violent severance from a former manner of life. 
And this is the way it's used consistently in the Old Testament. It can be uh, one that's cut off from the fold. Somebody could be cut off from worship. That is, they were not allowed to be in the worshiping community. Or they might be cut off sometimes from the protective care of God. Or we see here, they could be cut off from life itself. So the word indicates a separation. And he was cut off. Now, from what was he cut off? This says he was cut off out of the land of the living. Now, the land of the living, of course, is an expression, and it's really talking about the people who are alive. To be cut off from the land of the living means you're going to die. You're going to be separated from them physically. And so when he's cut off from the land of the living, there's no doubt about the fact that he did die. He died physically. He was separated here. But now we see that there is a further factor in this. He was cut off for. The word for indicates a substitution. He was cut off for the transgression of my people. The word transgression, it's the Hebrew word that means a rebellion. There are a lot of different words for sin found in Scripture. This one indicates a rebellion against God. It's a rebellion against the laws of God, the commands of God. And so Israel has been in rebellion. And so the servant is going to be cut off for the rebellion of my people. Now, who are my people? There's some debate about the word my. Does it refer to Isaiah? Is Isaiah inserting himself into this song? And uh, now he says, my people, that is Jews. Or is this a reference to God saying, my people? Well, it doesn't really make too much difference in the meaning of the verse because in either case, it refers to Israel in the time of Christ. My people, he was cut off for the transgression of my people. But this is also going to include uh, the chosen people of God, the Jews. But what we have here actually is a clear statement of substitutionary death. Why was he cut off? For the transgression of my people. And then we have an expression. I don't know, in the, in the New King James, we have, he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. But what we have here is he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Why was he cut off? For the rebellion of my people, and they deserved that death is what this is saying. The rebellion of my people to whom the blow or the stroke was due. So this word stroke, it means a stroke. Sometimes it was used for a plague or a disease, but it means... You're struck with something. To whom the stroke was due, it's a clear statement of substitutionary death. Israel deserved to die. They deserved death because of their rebellion against God. And yet Jesus Christ suffered this himself. So they deserved the blow. He took the blow. And so the blow was due to Israel, but it fell on the servant. And the verse is saying here, and people didn't understand this. They had no idea what was going on. They didn't comprehend it. Who among the generation of Jesus considered, contemplated, thought about the fact that he didn't deserve to die and that he was actually dying in the place of his people. All right, we move from here 
where we have a, a description of the servant's suffering and death. And now we move to some facts about his burial in verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So this verse talks about the burial of the servant and the points made here. He was assigned a grave with uh, the criminals because he died a criminal's death. It was assumed apparently by those who were in charge of such things that he was going to be buried as a criminal. But divine justice overruled and he will be buried in a rich man's tomb. And so uh, we see that the innocent servant received an honorable burial in spite of the intention of his enemies. And so uh, the expectation was he's going to die as a criminal, he's going to be buried as a criminal. Now it was unusual uh, for a criminal to have this kind of burial. In the culture of that day, the usual thing was to be buried with your fathers. It'd be like a family plot, a place where the family would be buried. And so often uh, we have this expression that uh, he's buried with his fathers. And to be denied burial with your father, that was a calamity. We can find places in Scripture where somebody was not allowed to be buried with his father, and that was they considered that to be a, a horrible thing. And for those who didn't have uh, a family grave, then there would be a, uh, a common burial ground, and references are made in uh, a few different passages. He was buried in a common place, a common grave. And of course, uh, we're also familiar with the money that uh, was given to Judas, and then when he started feeling so bad about what he had done, he took the money back and he just threw it back at the priests and uh, uh, told them they could take their blood money. But, uh, of course, they, they wouldn't use this for any religious purposes because, after all, it was blood money. And so what did they do? They bought a potter's field. The potter's field, it was just a worthless piece of ground. Nobody wanted the ground. I mean, it had all that broken pottery in it, and nothing was growing, and nobody would want to clean that up. And so they said, well, we'll just buy that field out there. It's worthless, and we'll use that as a common burial ground for people who don't have a family with whom to be buried. So Jesus is not going to be buried in a commoner's grave. After Jesus suffered all of the indignities, the beatings, the scourging, and then all of the horrors of crucifixion, and after he had suffered all of that, the Father said, that's enough. No more indignities. They, he is not going to have the indignity of being buried in a criminal's grave. That indignity is ended. So we see here, they made his grave. Who was they? We don't know. Actually, we have a singular word here. It means one or someone. Uh, or we could say, someone appointed his grave or his grave was appointed. It was assigned with wicked men, but he was actually buried in a rich man's tomb. Now the wicked here is plural, and it means the thieves, the murderous thieves who were crucified on either side of him. They made his grave with the wicked ones, yet with the rich in his deaths. Now, the word rich is singular, so it's a rich man. And this is, of course, Joseph of Arimathea, in whose burial vault Jesus was interred. 
And it's with the rich one in his deaths. Actually, it's plural, and it's an unusual construction because we don't think about people dying twice. We think about physical death, and that's it. But this is a very unusual construction, and it says in his deaths, Jesus actually died twice on the cross. First of all, he died spiritually when God the Father laid on God the Son's uh, God the Son, all of our iniquities. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so Jesus is separated from the Father in a spiritual sense while He was bearing our sins on the cross from 12 noon until 3 o'clock. After He had finished paying the penalty for the sins of the world, then that spiritual death was lifted. And once again, he can talk to his father. And he does talk to his father. And Jesus, after he had died spiritually and is now spiritually alive again, is when he cried out, it's finished. Not his life, not his ministry. That's not what he's saying was finished. But rather this work of salvation, everything necessary for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life has been provided through that death on the cross. And he was sent into the world to die, and now it's finished. He accomplished the task. The servant has carried out his responsibilities. And so... They made his grave with the wicked ones. They assigned him that. But he was with the rich in his deaths. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, means although he had done no wrong to others. So we see his character here. He hadn't done any violence. He hadn't said anything to deceive. And so the suffering servant is without sin. He has done nothing for which to be punished. There's no guilt. There were six trials of Jesus, and the ultimate verdict, I find no fault in him. He is without sin, as we find in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He is the lamb without blemish and without spot. In him is no sin. All right, now we come to the fifth strophe. And that's in verses 10 through 12. So just like this song began with the divine proclamation in which Yahweh announces the exaltation of his servant, behold, my servant... Look at him. Behold, my servant, he shall be exalted. He shall be extolled. He shall be very high. You see, the Lord makes this very plain right from the outset. We're going to have horrible descriptions of his suffering, of his death. And yet, God has said he will be exalted. And we're going to have another divine proclamation in this fifth strophe where the Lord again promises the exaltation of the suffering servant. Now, let's go ahead and uh, read these three verses. If I can get them, let's start in. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So we see that God is going to glorify this servant. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, 
My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So we see that the vindication of the servant comes after his death. So a great miracle has taken place because after his death and burial, he is enabled to see his offspring, to prolong his days, to witness the successful completion of his mission. He is going to see fruit for his labors. Comes after his death. And so the promise of the Lord is introduced by a declaration here in which Isaiah reveals that the will of Yahweh is accomplished through the sacrificial death and then the subsequent exaltation of the servant. Now he first promises that the servant will justify many and then secondly that he will have victorious dominion because he died bearing the sins of many. So uh, the Lord sees the servant's suffering as the redemption of sinners and triumph over death. So in verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now the word pleased, it doesn't mean God, oh, I'm so happy that this happened. That's not what it means uh, to be pleased with here. The word does mean to take delight in, to be pleased with, but the concept here is that God had a plan for his servant. He was pleased in that sense. This is what God wanted to do. It's what God wanted to happen. He had a plan from all eternity past to provide for the salvation of the human race. That's what it means. It pleased the Lord. It was His pleasure to provide for you, to provide for your salvation. It pre pleased the Lord to bruise Him, or the word is crushed. This is the word that was found back in verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The word means he was crushed. Now this is not a physical crushing, but rather it is the idea that he endured the spiritual uh, death bearing our sins, and so he is crushed in that sense. And it pleased the Lord to do this, and he did it. The Lord was pleased to do this because it meant salvation for you, for me, for the world. So we have here his spiritual suffering. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. The word grief means to become sick, diseased, or to be grieved. Could have translated this, I suppose. He made him sick. But it's certainly not a physical sickness as seen throughout this song that this is talking about spiritual suffering. It's our sins that were laid upon him that crushed him, that brought about all of this suffering. Now, it says, when you make his soul an offering for sin. You see, it's his soul that's the offering for the sin here. Now, this is addressed to God directly as the one who has the prerogative of pointing Christ's life as an offering for sin. The man can inflict suffering and death on the servant in a physical sense, but only the Lord could make his life a guilt offering. There were 
thousands upon thousands of people who were crucified by the Romans. How was the death of Jesus any different? You say, well, he was innocent. That's beside the point. What makes his death different from that of all of the others? It's the fact that he poured out his soul unto death. He is going to be a guilt offering for the sins of the world. Now, the word that he has here, offering, there were numerous offerings found in the Levitical Code. You can read about them, uh, particularly in uh, Leviticus chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the word that's used here is the word that is used for a guilt offering, sometimes called a reparation offering. And uh, this is a, a very interesting offering. Uh, this is one that involved the payment of 120% damages, <laughs> as well as the presentation of the sacrificial animal itself. So the word... Um, offering here. Um, sometimes it's called a trespass offering. Uh, denotes being guilty of infringing or violating the rights of others, whether it be of God or whether it be for, for some person. And so a sign reads, no trespassing. And you go beyond the sign and you're guilty of violating the property, property rights of another. And you could experience the full force of the law. And this is the same thing with anyone who trespasses against God's law. And so this was the offering that was required when someone deprived another, whether it be God or a man, of his rightful due. And uh, usually this offering required a restitution payment, a fine, if you will, so that uh, let's say you had damaged somebody's ox. Well, not only did you have to replace the ox, but you had to give another 20% so that there was a reparation, a restitution. And uh, the, uh, the animal that was offered as part of this sacrifice was not part of the restitution, uh, but they had to offer a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, uh, and that was uh, to pay for the sin before God, and then on top of that, there had to be something else that was paid. So we have here Christ as our trespass offering or guilt offering, and he is paying for the damage, the injury that has been done by sin. So there has been a trespass, God has been injured in some way by the sin of man, and now Jesus Christ is going to offer this trespass offering. So when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. So we have here... How can one who has died see his seed, that is, his descendants? How can one who has died prolong his days? This is done by resurrection. So that even though Jesus Christ was obedient even to the point of death, through the miracle of resurrection, he is going to see the outcome of his work on the cross. He is going to see the labor rewarded. The cross has an effect, and it's going to be the redemption of those who will put their faith in him. So he shall see his seed, that is, those who are going to put faith in him for salvation. He shall prolong his days, and so this is the time after his death and burial, uh, it comes about through his bodily resurrection. And so we see here a prophecy, actually, of resurrection. Not stated in those terms, but this is the only way that it could happen. If he has poured out his soul unto death, 
and yet he is going to prolong his days. He's going to see his seed. There must be a miraculous work of God, and that is the resurrection. Okay, and now... In verse, okay. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Again, we have the pleasure of the Lord. It's talking about the fact that God has a plan. God knows what he's doing. He had this plan from all eternity past. It included the virgin birth, the incarnation, the ministry of Christ on the earth, and then his death, burial, resurrection, but then also his ascension, his session, uh, his future reign upon the earth over the kingdom, and then for all eternity, this servant is going to be exalted and extolled and be very high. He's going to be glorified. And so uh, this is the pleasure of the Lord that's going to prosper in his hand. God is going to fulfill his plan. God is omniscient. He knows all things. And on the basis of knowing all things, he designed this plan. And because God is perfect, his plan is perfect. A perfect God cannot come up with an imperfect plan. But God not only plans, but God is omnipotent, and God has the power to carry out his plan. Now, I can make a lot of plans and they don't come to fruition because I simply don't have the ability to make it happen. But God, because he has designed this perfect plan, is able to execute it perfectly because he is all-powerful. And so the pleasure of the Lord, the pleasure of Yahweh, is going to prosper in the hand of his servant. Jesus Christ is going to perfectly fulfill the Father's plan for the incarnation, for the salvation of the human race, and for the future as well. In verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul. Labor, travail, it's a word for suffering great pain. It's talking about what Jesus endured on the cross, bearing our sins when he was crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the travail of his soul, the labor of his soul. God the Father will see what Jesus is doing on the cross while he's bearing our sins, and he will be satisfied. This is the doctrine of propitiation. Propitiation is one of those Bible words. You find it in, in Romans chapter 3. You find it again in, in 1 John. It means satisfaction. Justice demands a penalty. If there is no penalty for violation of law, then law is meaningless. There must be a penalty attached to every law, otherwise the law has no teeth. Now, God is perfect in his character. God is absolutely without sin. He is holy. He is separate from anything that is sinful. He is separate from all of his creation. He is holy. A man, by nature and action, is unholy. We are unholy. We are sinful. We rebel against God. We transgress his laws. And this demands a penalty. God cannot overlook sin ever. He cannot excuse any sin. He can't say, well, that's not a big deal. I'm going to let it go this time, but don't do it again. No, he couldn't do that. You stop and think about the original sin in the human race. They ate a piece of fruit. Is that a big deal? Not from our perspective. Now, we don't know what the fruit was. I mean, it might be a little thing like a cherry. I mean, maybe Apple, we don't know what it was. doesn't matter. The point is they disobeyed God, 
And they ate of the fruit, but you might say, but it's a big tree. It has lots of fruit. It'll grow more. Is this a big sin? Not from our perspective, but from God's perspective, it violated his holiness and it plunged the entire human race into ruin. And it's because of that one sin that we are all made sinners. You're a sinner because of Adam's sin. God had announced the penalty for sin. The day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. They ate and they died immediately. Because justice, perfect justice, demands a penalty be paid. Now, if I pay that penalty for sin, then I will be separated from God forever. So God sent his own son into the world to be my substitute, to die in my place. And Jesus Christ paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. This is 1 John 2.2. 2. And he, Christ, he himself is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross and bearing our sins, satisfied the demands of divine justice. That's propitiation. He will see the travail, the labor of his soul, and be satisfied. God saw Jesus Christ paying the penalty for our sins, and that satisfied the demands of divine justice. What a wonderful truth. Christ died in our place, and it was enough. It was sufficient. It satisfied God the Father. By his knowledge... My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now there's a question about this statement by his knowledge. What does that mean? It's difficult. Does it mean what he knows, his knowledge? Or does it mean by knowing about him? And scholars have debated this. They've argued over, is this subjective or is it objective? Is it the knowledge of the servant or is it my knowledge about the servant? I don't know. I think it's knowing about him. As a result of knowing about him and putting faith in him, then I am justified or declared right with God, declared righteous. By his knowledge, or if you want to say it's by the knowledge of the servant, he knew the plan of God, he executed the plan of God, and because he fulfilled that plan of God, it's on this basis that he will justify many now, notice who does the justifying here. My righteous servant. Okay. He is righteous. And it's the, we, we can't see it in our English translation, but you have the word righteous defining servant. It says he will justify many. But the word justify comes from the same word. The righteous servant will declare righteous the many. What is justification? Justification is a legal declaration made by God. It's not a change that God makes in a person. It's not that God makes you righteous as if somehow he infuses uh, a change into you and suddenly you're not a sinner anymore or not as bad a sinner. But rather it's a declaration that God makes 
based upon the imputation of divine righteousness. The Bible declares that when you put faith in Jesus Christ, God gives you his righteousness as a free gift. You get it as a gift. That's Romans 3, uh, 21, 22, Philippians 3, 9, Romans 5, 17 declares that righteousness is a gift. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, righteousness is credited to your account in heaven. So we see Abraham. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to his account for righteousness. And that's what we have here. We have justification or the declaration of divine righteousness. And this is on the basis of the righteous servant of God. He will justify the many. The many here are those who will put faith in him for salvation. Why? Because he will bear their iniquity, and therefore he is the one who has the right to declare people righteous because he paid for their sins. Jesus is our righteousness. So my righteous one, my servant, he will furnish righteousness to the many, for he shall bear their iniquities. This is the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 12, the conclusion of this magnificent song, we see the servant is going to be rewarded because of his substitutionary suffering and death. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. The word great here actually is the word many. It's the same word translated many in verse 11. And it refers to the same people, those who are redeemed, those who are declared righteous. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. These are the ones who put faith in Jesus Christ, who respond to the gospel message. And this happens because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. This, this song is so beautiful. It is so rich. It is so deep. I would encourage you to memorize it. It's not that long. Start in 52.13. Go through chapter 53. It's only 15 verses. It's just magnificent. And this is the clearest declaration of the gospel that you're going to find in the Old Testament. And verse 6, there's the gospel in a nutshell. The Lord, God the Father, has laid on him, God the Son, the iniquity of us all. Father in heaven, I give thanks for Jesus. I thank you that you sent him into the world. I thank you that he was willing to humble himself, leave the glories of heaven, suffer all the humiliation, the indignities, the rejection by people, your people, by us. I thank you that he died for us. And I thank you that we can know him and that we can know that what he did accomplished your plan. It was your pleasure to plan for our salvation. It was his pleasure to carry out that plan. So we just want to praise you and thank you tonight for your unspeakable gift. The gift so great that it can't be adequately described in human terms. Thank you. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will give us understanding about these things that we have seen. And because we have looked into your word tonight in this passage, may we have a greater appreciation, a deeper love for our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved us, gave himself for us. 
Father, I pray now for your mercy. You'll take us safely to our homes. And I pray that you give us grace that we can again come together to worship you, to fellowship with you through the word, to magnify your name, bring glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.